Hey everybody, welcome back to Instant Gameplay. My name is Sean, and we did it. We're here. This is the final installment of our top 50 games of all time. This is numbers 10 through 1. If you haven't seen the rest of the series, please go back and watch the rest of the countdowns, the rest of the installments, because I don't want there to be any sort of spoilers, because we have mentioned games that have previously been on previous lists, so please go and watch those if you haven't done so already. But, uh, I don't know, I can't wait anymore. There are some amazing games over here to show you. I can't wait anymore. I know you can't wait anymore. Let's get into it. Here it is, number 10. Kicking off this entry of the countdown with number 10 is a deck building game. And we've talked about a couple deck building games already. But this one's a little different because it combines deck building and an actual board game where you're going into a dungeon to steal some treasure, and that is my number 10, and that is Clank. This game is by Renegade, Renegade Game Studios, two to four players, 30 to 60 minutes. It says age is 13 and up. That's not accurate at all. My daughter plays this, and you know we started playing this when she was eight years old, and it's a fantastic game. In this game, like it, like it says, it's a deck builder. But as you are, as I said before, you're going into a dungeon to try to collect treasure. All the treasures worth different amount of points, so you have some choices to make. You can go into the dungeon, and the deeper you go, the better the treasure. So you can go to the, you know, just the dip your toes into the dungeon, grab a quick five point treasure, and get out. Or you can go deep into the dungeon and encounter all the dangers that come with that in order to get those bigger and better treasures. The catch is there's a dragon down there and the more noise you make or the more clank you make is going to cause that dragon to wake up and uh, cause you some damage and you don't want to do that because if you run out of health points you lose. Uh, it's not only just a deck builder, it's also a race to get out of the dungeon first because if you get out of that dungeon first you do secure your points and you do get some bonus points for that. It also puts more pressure on the other players once someone does leave the dungeon because they will only have a certain amount of turns to get out of the dungeon. Um, there's other aspects to the game too. I don't want to spoil anything though because this game is so great. There's also Clank in Space. That is the sequel to this game. I have not played Clank in Space. Um, I'm generally not a fan of sci-fi. It just it doesn't really appeal to me as much as other themes, but this one did. This is more of a fantasy theme. There's two sides to the board when you play, so there's an easy mode and a more advanced mode. I've played on both. I enjoy both. Um, got my wife to play this one with me, and she thought it was okay. My daughter really likes this one as well, but uh, yeah, it's a fantastic game. If you like deck builders and you like fantasy, I can't recommend any other game besides my number 10, Clank. My number 9 is a great area control game by Days of Wonder. And as I've mentioned in previous entries, Days of Wonder just puts out beautiful, beautiful games. Even if you don't like their games, you can't deny that the games are gorgeous. But this is an area control game and it is Small World, my number 9. I love Small World. This game is so great. It kind of is like Risk. I mean, if you've played Risk, you know area control, right? I mean, it's not exactly like Risk, but just to give you a, a point of reference here. But in this game, you are taking on the roles of different mythical creatures. You know, there's, uh, let's see, skeletons, ghouls, trolls, humans, dwarfs, giants, all sorts of stuff. And each one of them has different abilities. They could give you more money on a turn. They can allow you to make it cheaper for you to invade certain areas. But their abilities will change every single game because the abilities and the races are two separate tiles. So you're going to put them together in a bunch of different ways and that's going to allow you for massive replay. So in, this, in the example they use on the back, you could have heroic giants. But in your next game, you, next game, you could have heroic rat men. Or you could have, uh, let's see, what's the other one here? Uh, commando elves. You know, so there's a ton of different ways to play this game. I love it. It plays anywhere from two to five players, and each player count has a different map, a different sized map. There's two boards that come with this. They're both double-sided. My daughter loves this game. This was the first game she played that got her into modern designer board games, and I've, I've loved it for the same reasons she did. It says eight and up. She started playing this at age like five. I mean, she 
we just love this game and it's it's great plays in 40 to 80 minutes i think that's pretty accurate depending on your player count I've played it at all player counts, and it's fantastic. It works well with all of them. Five is a lot. It is a lot there. It works best with three or four, but two is great because of the size of the board they give you. There's also a ton of expansions that add more races and more abilities. I love this game. Um, it, it's it's fantastic. For there's a lot. Of, the people I've told about this list, this was another game that they said that's got to be on your list. Well, it is. It is my number nine. Small World. My number eight is another Days of Wonder game, but this one is not area control. This one is a semi-cooperative Days of Wonder game themed to King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, and that is Shadows Over Camelot. I love this game. I know I say that for all these games that I love them, but I really truly do. This game is very similar to a game that we talked about in a previous entry, Dead of Winter, but this one is themed to King Arthur. So you are trying to work together, you are playing the different knights of the round table, and you are working together to go on different quests that King Arthur had to do. So, you know, finding the Holy Grail, finding the Sword of Excalibur, defeating the Black Knight, things like that, and you are working together to try to do that. However, someone probably, most likely, is a traitor, and they are obviously trying to stop you from doing those things it and it i love this game it's a, it's a hard game i mean this game is very difficult if you are not the trader for the first time players i do recommend you play without the trader mechanic just so you can get used to the different things that are going on in the game it's a hard enough game as it is you add a trader on top of it and it makes it very difficult and to be honest i've never i've never won this game never but I've had more fun losing this game than winning some other ones just because of all of the inevitable Monty Python references that come out and people seem to really like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table as a story and he's made his way into many different games and I think it's just a fantastic uh, way to get people into gaming is to show them something they know like this particular story. People know this story um, but it's, it's just so, so great. I love it. If, just like in Dead of Winter, you have to get your main stuff done, but also worry about your own individual stuff. This game doesn't have the individual uh, goals like Dead of Winter does, but you do have to worry about the, the traitor, and you have your own individual hand of cards, so it's a little different than Dead of Winter, but in, in the end, it, I find it better than Dead of Winter. And in the end, I think that it will appeal to a wider variety of audiences than Dead of Winter. But they're both fantastic games. This one just hits it a little higher on the list. And that is my number eight, Shadows Over Camelot. My number seven is a game that so many people thought was just going to be a flash in the pan in popularity because it's got a theme that no other game really has, and it, it's a very, very popular game. And I didn't think I'd actually like the game mostly because of the theme, but then I played it, and I love it. It's fantastic. And that is Wingspan. This game is awesome. It's a game about bird watching, which would not appeal to me in the slightest had I not watched a video and did some research and seen this fantastic engine builder. It is an engine builder. You have this board in front of you with three different habitats that house th many different types of birds. And throughout the game, you're going to be collecting birds to put in those habitats. And each bird allows you to do an additional action at that specific location. So if I go to the wetlands, I'm gonna be able to do just whatever that, whatever action I wanna do there, but, if I add birds to that location, I can take additional actions on my turn that those birds let me do. Like for example, some actions allow you to take extra bird cards, tuck them behind other ones, and those score you points. Some cards allow you to take extra food tokens that you have and store them on tokens. And that's just fantastic too. Um, what you're trying to do is get the most points by the end of the game. Every game is going to be very different because there's different objectives. There's four objectives that you're going to have to do in the four different rounds and those will change every every game. Um, there's also different eggs that look like Easter candy and I'm not even joking. They look delicious but don't eat them because don't. They're not candy but they look like candy. And those you get points for those. 
the coolest thing about this game is it comes with a dice tower, which I know, okay, a lot of games come with dice towers, but this one looks like a bird feeder. And then you put the little dice in the back and they come out and that's how you decide, that's how you see what food is available that particular round. It's so great. Look up this game. It's also by Stonemeyer Games. I Stonemeyer puts out fantastic, fantastic games. And this has one heck of a solo mode, which we will definitely cover on the channel because I've played the solo mode more in this game than I have the actual game itself. I love the solo mode, the the, the Automa, um, or Automa, whichever we prefer to pronounce it. It's just phenomenal in in Wingspan. So that is, if, if, you, if you haven't checked it out or if the theme is holding you back, please give it a chance because this game is fantastic. It's my number seven, Wingspan. Number six is a game that might as well just be called Jurassic Park the board game because that's really what it is just without the IP and that probably gave it away as it is this box is being uncooperative but I don't care my number six Dinosaur Island in this game you are the owners of a dinosaur amusement park and I'm not kidding that's literally what the game is about it is Jurassic Park the board game without the license. Um, but it's not just that. You're not just doing the theme park because you also have to, it, and it's hard, it's a worker placement game. And what you are doing, and there's a couple, the, the game takes up a huge footprint on the table. And really what you're doing is besides just getting the stuff in your park, you're doing other stuff too. Really, how do I, how do I describe this game? There's a lot going on with this game. So, and on one board, you have your different DNA that you have to look at, your dinosaur DNA. And you're gonna, you're actually going to monitor those throughout the game and change those and increase and decrease those to get the kinds of dinosaurs and the things that you want. That's the research part of the game. Then the second part of the game, and that's all the research side of it, right? On the other side of the game, you actually have your business part, which is your theme park that you have to do. You're building attractions, you're letting dinosaurs in, but there are specific rules on what kind of dinosaurs, like how they have to be stored and things like that. Um, there's also security threats that you have to deal with because it's a dinosaur theme park, so of course there's security threats. There's literally three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or however many movies dedicated to why this is a bad idea. Like don't, any scientists out there, please don't experiment with like bringing dinosaurs back to life. There's literally movies telling you that it's a bad idea. Don't do it. But in board game, it's fine. Um, but I love this game. This game is by Pandasaurus Games, which is just fantastic. Um, I think the, the description on the box really gives it, really describes it the best. And it says, you're taking on the role of a park manager at one of the premier destinations. You've been handed the reins um, to the operation and you want to bring fantastic creatures of the Jurassic, Triassic, and Cretaceous periods forward into the modern day. Early retirement is yours if you can make the park bigger and better than the competition. So really you are competing against the other players to have a better park than them. But there's also other dangers involved because of the dinosaurs, the security risks, things of that nature. Um, so really it's a matter of controlling your business and also controlling the research to get better dinosaurs and better uh, attractions. Um, I haven't played this very much. It, it doesn't hit the table as much as I wish it would. And I think that's mostly just because like I say, oh, I got the Jurassic Park board game and people are really excited, but then I lay it out or I show them how much stuff is in the game and they're like, whoa, that's a lot. And it is, it is a lot, but it's not nearly as complicated as it looks. In fact, this is probably one of the easier worker placement games that I own. Um, but yeah, there is a solo mode in here and I'll probably experiment with that a little bit, hopefully. If you wanna see, comment down below on the solo games you want me to cover or just any games you want me to cover and we will go ahead and do that. Uh, this game is for two to four players. Uh, it says eight and up and that's pretty accurate. My daughter learned this last year and she was fine with it. Um, 90 to 120 minutes, it is one of those longer games but it's totally worth it. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. It's Jurassic, but it's not because it's Dinosaur Island. My number five game, we are in the, we are in the top five. This is my number five game. We only got five games left. My number five game is a game, it's a sandbox game, which a lot of people don't like. I love sandbox games because they allow you to do literally whatever you want in the game. It's so great. It's got a really cool theme. Um, you don't see a lot of games which are themed, a lot of good games themed to the Old West. But this is one of them, and this is Western Legends, my number five. Uh, I love the, the theme of this game. 
uh, just because in the game you can literally do whatever you want. You want to be a sheriff? You can be a sheriff. You want to be a bandit? You can be a bandit. You want to go ahead and uh, just play poker? You can play poker. You want to steal cattle and deliver it to another ranch? You can do that. I mean, there's just so many ways to earn points in this game. But really, what, what it comes down to with this particular game is you are a person in in the Western times, in the Old West, and you are trying to make the best, or in some cases, worst name for yourself to earn the most points. And that's really all you get because there's so much other stuff going on in this game. You can do whatever you want. You can go to the casino and play poker because the action cards are also a poker cards. How cool is that, right? Um, you can you could go just go shopping and get some really cool stuff there. Uh, let's see, what else can you You can rob a bank. That's one of my favorite things to do in the game is rob the bank because the mechanics in there are so cool because the sheriff is going to be out there too. And if the sheriff catches you, you could end up in jail. Um, if you are a sheriff, if you um, are a, uh, a sheriff or, you know, a deputy or whatever you want to call it, if you're part of law enforcement, you can go ahead and arrest the other player if they're getting into trouble, which makes it so cool. So you can do whatever you want in this game. It's really, really great. Uh, let's see, it is by Colossal Games, and the box is pretty colossal, I will give it that, it's a very big game. There's several expansions for this, I've played with a couple of them, uh, not on my copy, but I've played with a couple of them, I do enjoy them. The My favorite expansion is probably the one where you get to rob trains, that one is very, very fun. It's a very fun expansion. Uh, but let's see, what is the, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't say, oh yes it does. Two to six players, which I've played with two, three, and four players. I've never gone up to six. I think that would be a bit much just because of what's going on in the game. 90 to 120 minutes is pretty accurate. Very fun, though, with uh, shorter games and even longer games. But you can set the difficulty of the game and how long you want the game to last, which is a great thing. You, you It's not just going to be like, I want the game to be 90, but it's going to be 120. You can set that, which is great. Um, and 14 plus... Uh, maybe maybe 12 year olds could understand this. There's a lot going on in this game. There's a lot going on, but it's nothing too difficult. The hardest part is poker, but they give you a a player guide that lets you know what hands beat one what, and if you're familiar with poker and how that works, you'll be fine. But if you like Western things, Western movies, John Wayne, you know things like that, this game is definitely for you. And it is my number five Western Legends. My number four game is a game that I wish was higher up on my list. And I know it's number four, so it's already really high on my list. But it doesn't hit the table nearly as much as it should. It's got an amazing theme. And actually, it's my number one horror-themed game, and I love horror. It's my number one horror-themed game, but the game takes forever. I think on a lower end, you're going to be playing for like two to three hours minimum. But it's fantastic. It's a one versus all game, and that is... Fury of Dracula. If you like horror at all, Vampires, Dracula, get this game. And I say that because the game is amazing. It's by WizKids. Well, this edition is. There's a few different editions, but this is the current edition uh, that should... I don't know if it's currently available or not, but the version I have is by WizKids. Uh, it says on here, a game of deduction and gothic horror for two to five players. You don't want to play with two players because uh, in this game, one person takes on the role of Dracula which is the role I prefer to play as, because I love playing as Dracula in this game. And they are trying to make their way across Europe and spread their influence, their you know vampire influence around Europe, and they're gonna get points for doing so. All the other players are gonna be playing famous vampire hunters like Van Helsing, and they're gonna be trying to track Dracula down. The trick is Dracula, it's a hidden movement game, so Dracula is hidden from the board. His mini only comes out when he when you find him. Um, so it's very hard to find Dracula sometimes, and sometimes you randomly run into him when you shouldn't. But the reason I say you shouldn't play with two players is because all of the vampire hunters have to be in play in every game. So one player, if you're playing a two-player game, one player has to play Dracula, the other player automatically has to take on the role of all other heroes and it's just a lot for one player to take on a three-player game i think is the minimum and i think that works really well anyway because each of the hunters just takes two hunters that's not bad a four-player game one person takes two that's not bad five players is the best player count because each player gets one hunter and then there's one dracula so i think that's the best but and i've only played this with 
three and four player accounts. I've never played it with five, but I would assume it'd be the best. But this game is fantastic. There's nothing like tracking down Dracula when you, you, like you're out there and you're just, you, you can't find him and just randomly you find him and then you have to fight him. But you're not prepared to fight him, so you try to run and he doesn't let you. But then you try to run again and you get away. And then you have to find him all over again because now you're finally prepped to fight, but he's disappeared again and you don't know where he is. So much fun. Again, I wish this game was higher on my list. If it gets more plays in the next year, it will go up. I can guarantee that it will go up if it gets more plays. But man, I can't say anything else because I've already said so many good things about this game. But if somebody wants to play this with me, please do because I love this game. That is my number four, Fury of Dracula. My number three game is the highest ranked worker placement game on my list. And I've already covered quite a few. So what's left? Well, this one is what's left. It's from Gray Fox Games, Champions of Midgard. This, for a long time, was ranked as my daughter's number one game. I don't know if it is anymore, um, but it, it was for a while. Um, it's a Viking-themed game, which is not a theme I tend to enjoy. I actually had um, another Viking game, uh, Blood Rage, and I had that game for a very long time. Played it, liked the game fine. It's, it's a very good game, very, very good game. Um, and I actually ended up getting rid of it just for lack of play. No one really wanted to play that Viking game because when I would talk about Vikings, they wanted to play Champions in Midgard because it was a little bit easier, and I can respect that and I can understand that. It is a much easier game than Blood Rage. And Blood Rage is a combat uh, do, you know, area control game. Um, I don't have it anymore, and it wouldn't have made my top 50 anyway, and I figure if I can only keep 50 games, they should be the ones in my top 50. Besides the point, Blood Rage is great, and if there's a lot of people who love Blood Rage, it's a really great game. Besides the point, that's not my number three. Champions of Midgard is my number three. This is a worker placement game. You are Vikings. You're going throughout the board trying to get the resources and things you need in order to be a successful Viking. There's also different monsters you have to face. There are trolls, and you want to face the trolls because if no one faces the trolls, the trolls kind of rampage across town, and then everybody suffers. There's also different monsters you can face in town, but then you can also take journeys out over the water to get those monsters as well, which is more reward for you there. Um, there's also different things. The, the really cool thing about this game that I love is when you're recruiting um people to fight for you, they're represented by dice. And there's three different types of dice in the base game, and they have different weaponry and they have different, you know, distribution of, of die faces. But that's how you fight the troll and the other monsters, is with these dice. And it's very interesting because when you're when your people die, you just lose those dice. So it's a very, very cool mechanic to 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 attack and to gain um, troops and stuff. Very, very cool. Um, but again, my daughter really likes this one. I really like this one. There are a couple expansions. Haven't had the opportunity. That, there was a game store that was very close to me that had both expansions for like 15 bucks a piece, and I should have jumped on it, and I didn't, and I regret it every day because I should have jumped on that expansion, and I didn't. Um, but I would love to play with the expansions. I've heard wonderful things about them. But the base game is just fine as... It is. I don't think you need the expansions necessarily. That's me having not played with them, but I mean the base game offers enough where I don't think they're necessary and if you just want to get the base game and you don't have anything, that's fine. Um, but yeah, if, if you really want a strong worker placement game with a strong theme and it's not just put a guy out, take the resource, turn those resources into points, it's put a guy out there, get some warriors, but I also need some food, but I also need to attack the troll, but I also, there's a lot more going on. This would be a good next step worker placement game. Start with something maybe like Lords of Waterdeep and work your way up to this. Um, for I have friends and family who like worker placement games. They've very much responded well to the other worker placement games that I have, but they haven't tried this yet and they will because it's a great game. It is my number three, Champions of Midgard. My number two game. This game is my number two. We actually just finished the playthrough of this. It's a adventure style game and we just finished playing through it for the first time. And I think that's why it hits so high up on the list. It's got a recency, it's very recent, it's a recency bias. And it's got a really awesome theme. <laughs> I really love this theme. And that is my number two. I gotta get it out over here. Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. 
This is a cooperative deck building game. And like I said, my wife and I actually just finished our full playthrough of this. And it is a deck builder, just like other games we've talked about where, you know, you're using the cards in your hand to buy better cards so you can beat the villains. And that's the, that's the biggest part of the game is you want to, you have to beat all the villains in your given scenario. And I say scenario because there are seven of them. There's one for every movie or book in the game. And I'm not going to show you too much because there's some spoilers in here, but everything comes in one of these little boxes. This is game one. Well, there's seven of these boxes, and as you get through, you open the game the game, you open the box, and you add that to your next game. So you're adding more cards, more things to your character, special abilities, things like that. I don't want to give away too much because it is just very much a spoiler heavy game and I don't want to do that. Um, one of the coolest things about this game too is apart from the stuff that's in the box, the rule book has a little spot in the back that has room for all the instructions that come in little boxes. That's There's no spoilers there, it's just the instructions. So that's really cool. It's, they, they, they put a lot of thought into that. There is also a Toy Story game, Toy Story Obstacles and Adventure game. It uses the exact same deck building system as Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. It's literally the exact same game, just with a different theme. My wife and I are playing through that right now. As far as I can tell, they're they're very, very similar. Um, just kind of choose your flavor. But I couldn't put that on the list because we haven't finished a playthrough of it yet. Um, we've played games of it, but we haven't finished the full. And I think that the only way to completely judge a legacy game or a game like this where there, you have to finish the whole thing is to finish the whole thing every adventure. You can't just do one or two and say you've played it. You need to go through the whole thing. Um, but this hits, this game will go down. It will not stay at my number two. I don't even suspect it'll stay within the top 10. I think recency bias has a lot to do with it. And I think because of recency bias, it hit all the way up to top, to number two. This game we won't play as much as the years go on because we've played it already. However, there are expansions that we have ordered and they are on their way and we are going to play them. And uh, hopefully that keeps this up for a little while longer, but this game will go down just because of the nature of the game. That's just how it is. But once the game, uh, but, but for now I'm gonna enjoy it as my number two game of all time, Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. All right, number one on my list. Please excuse the shirt change, some lighting change, audio change. I had a little bit of trouble when recording the number one slot on my list. Uh, basically my memory card corrupted, so I'm recording on my phone. So I apologize for the change in quality, but it's all good because we are at number one. My number one game has consistently been my number one game for the last three years that I have done this list. Now I haven't recorded the list that I've done in the past. Um, they've just been for me for fun, but this has been consistently my number one. And I don't know what it will take to dethrone this game by Stone Meyer Games, the one and only, my number one, Scythe. Scythe is my favorite game of all time. I love this game. Any chance I get to play it, I take it because this game is amazing. It's kind of a combination. It's between Risk because you got a little area of control, Settlers of Catan because you got some uh, resource management. Uh, there's a little bit of worker placement in there, not much, a little bit of worker placement in there. Um, and then there's a little bit of combat. I mean, it's just, there's so much stuff going on in this game. Uh, but basically you are in a alternate universe of World War I in the 1920s Europe, and you are trying to gain as uh, much area of the board and control of that board as you can. Basically what you're trying to do is there are several different uh, goals in the game, and you have these little stars, and you're trying to complete these tasks to get your stars on those tasks. Now once those are done, you put the star on there and then you're one step closer to victory. Um, and the game ends when so many of those tasks are complete. It, it, it's, it is amazing. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways to get those stars. You can win combat. You can um, get involved with a uh, little story pieces that are on the board. Uh, they're called encounter square or encounter spaces, I should say. Um, you can be popular. You can, you know, do your friends a favor. You have goals in your hand that you can try to complete. So there's a bunch of different ways, but you're moving throughout the board. This game has a ton of stuff. 
Apart from moving around your workers on the board, there is also, I apologize, my, my son is out there uh, screaming. Um, apart from that, uh, with the workers, you also have mechs on the board to move around and to get your resources and to do things like that. It's awesome. I love it. Uh, there are a bunch of expansions. There's a modular board you can use. There's also a campaign game called Rise of Fenris, which I have not played yet, but I really want to play. Um, there's just so much stuff for Scythe. I've upgraded some of the components. Um, not all of them, but just some of them. And it's just absolutely outstanding. If you've never played this game, go get your hands on a copy. Uh, it should still be in print. It should be available. Go get your hands on a copy and play it. It is phenomenal. And that is my number one game, Scythe. And that's going to do it for my top 50 games of all time. I want to thank you guys for joining me through this entire list. Please stay tuned to the channel for some really great board gaming content. I do plan to do uh, some more stuff uh, with, you know, games that I'm getting, games that I already have, um, more top lists in the future, and uh, look forward to all that right here. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, ring the bell notification icon, so you can be the first to know when new videos are uploaded right here on Instant Gameplay. For Instant Gameplay, this is Sean. Thanks for watching.